pick up. We're in fit three. And, and let me um, back up for just a moment. The the alliterative revival, which I said occurred from roughly 1350 to 75. Some people say it goes from 1350 to roughly 1400. Um, that was an attempt by primarily these writers in northwest England, or northern England if you want, not in the London area, to revive the Anglo-Saxon process of alliteration. The problem is they didn't know the rules. They didn't have the stuff that I put up on the board for you, okay? So what they do is they just do a lot of alliteration, which is why in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, um, Chaucer at one point, the persona Chaucer that the writer Jeff Chaucer creates for the poem, who's kind of an idiot, okay, um, makes a comment about rhyme and such. And he's talking about these northern rhymesters who write really bad poetry, okay? In William Langland's Piers Plowman, he has a line, and this is representative. There's a lot that I could use, but this is just one example. He writes, in a fair field full of folk found I there. One, two, three, four, five. Alliterating sounds. Okay. Bear in mind in Anglo-Saxon, how many alliterating sounds, you would have four stressed syllables, but only three of those, three, because I've got something in my mind, only three of those could actually alliterate. There you've got five. There are other poems that have more than that, that have six or seven. So it gets really boring after a while, right? It's like reading some of, um, oh, um, who is it? It's not Poe. Maybe it is Poe. The Cataracts of Lodore. Look that up online. And you get this rhyming pattern that's just kind of like a hammer beating into your brain after a while because it just doesn't end. It just goes on and on. Well, it's because it's mimicking the sound of a waterfall, okay? So, in the alliterative revival, it's the idea is, let's revive this. And it's not like, you know, a group of people get together one night over beer and say, you know, we really ought to try and bring that back. It just kind of happens organically. Okay? Yes? If uh, they were very poor at the uh, alliteration compared to the uh, old English, then, like, how did we find out about the rules? Right? Well, the rules aren't something that are written down. Yeah. The rules are what um, scholars of Old English and the various other Germanic languages, the Old Germanic languages, Old Saxonian, Old Low Franconian, Old Norse, Gothic, Old Saxon, Middle High German, High German, etc. They're the rules that they deduced from reading the alliterative poetry. That is, you read alliterative poetry in Old English, you read Old Norse alliterative poetry, you read the Old Saxon Helion, which is a poem which is titled The Lord. You read the Middle High German, the Nibelungenlied, okay? And you can deduce from the patterns in all of these that there are four stress syllables per line. Three of those stress syllables alliterate. The fourth stress syllable never alliterates. All vowels, words that begin with vowels, all vowels alliterate with other vowels. So it's, it's not because we found a text that has the rules written. It's on the basis of analysis of what's written. These are kind of the rules that were followed. Okay? But more than likely, somebody writing in 1350, if we knew who the author of Sir Gowan was, they wouldn't be able to read Old English. It was a dead language by then. Dead, like Latin. Okay? Um, dead, dead. It doesn't get quote-unquote revived until the 16th century when 
scholars start to look at it and they start to figure out how it means, what it means, and they do that on the basis of there were texts that had um, Old English and then somebody goes through and writes a Latin gloss on top. Or there are texts written in Latin, for example, the Bible, and somebody went through and wrote an Old English translation. Because they know what the Latin is, they can go through and figure out and figure out what case symbols are and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so let's pick up with Sir Gown and the Green Knight, page 259. And she has said, no woman in the world could turn you away. In fact, I'm lucky because, you know, you're the best man in the world, blah, blah, blah. And Sir Gowan says, you know, a shucks lady, but, you know, the, the night you have, he's better than I am. And he says, 1277, I am proud of the esteem that you hold me in, and in all gravity, your servant, my sovereign, I consider you, and I declare myself your knight. May Christ reward you. And so they talk of this and that until late morning, and then she goes her way, and Sir Gowan gets up. And she says before parting, like 1292, well, go back to 1291. She stood, as she stood, astonished him with a forceful rebuke. Okay. The rebuke implies he's done something wrong. May he who prospers each speech repay you this pleasure. But then you should be going, I very much doubt. Now, he's already said when she said, you are Sir Gawain. Everybody knows of your knowledge of love. And, all. and he's like, no, 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 no. You, you're thinking, oh, you're thinking that Gawain. No, 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 I'm Gawain the lesser. I'm, I'm the Gawain that nobody knows me. So she says here, that you should be Gawain, I very much doubt. Okay. What were we told when he left Arthur's house about his reputation? And now she says, you know, I don't, I, I don't think you are, Sir Gawain. Now, that's like a challenge. That's like, you're nobody. And he's like, why? What, what have I done? Fearing he had committed some breach of good manners. Right? He thinks he has violated the laws of chivalry and courtesy. But the lady said, bless you. This is like a good old Southern. Bless your heart. And says, for this reason, so good a knight as Gawain is rightly reputed and whom courtesy is so completely embodied could not easily have spent so much time with a lady without begging a kiss to comply with politeness. That is, it's polite for you to ask a kiss of me by some hint or suggestion at the end of a remark. Notice, to not come right out and say, kiss me, because, you know, that's a little bold, and she might say no. He said, let it be as you wish. That's it? Sure, I'll kiss you. I will kiss, what? At your bidding, okay, as befits a knight. That is, you have to ask. My previous class, I made a comment about the film Hitch, because there's a Shakespeare sonnet, has a line that encapsulates perfectly a scene in that film. Here's another one. That scene in Hitch, when um, Hitch, actor, Will Smith. Will Smith. <laughs> when Will Smith's character is with Kevin James's character, and it's night, and he's kind of, you know, well, 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 what if she expects a kiss? You know, if he's got this big gate lined up. What, what, what do I do? He goes, well, show me what you do. And he's, you know, I'm all out. And he goes, no, no, no. She moves 90% and you go in for the kill, the last 10, 10%. Okay? That's what he's saying. You, you make the move first. I will kiss at your bidding as befits the night. Does he stop there? No. And do more rather than displease you. Nor does he stop there. So urge it no further. That is, I'll kiss you if that's what you want. And I'll do more if that's what you want. But don't, don't urge that. And with that, she approaches him and takes him in her arms, stoops graciously over him and kisses the knight. 
They commit each other to Christ's keeping. She goes her way. He gets up and goes his way. Meanwhile, back in the forest, Bambi's being killed. Okay? And we get long discussion of Bambi being killed and gutted. Okay? Why? Aristocratic audience. So we're going to skip the disemboweling of the deer and everything. And pick up. Nighttime comes. The Lord returns. And 1375, in front of all of his men, he lays out all the venison in front of Sir Gallant. And he goes, you like? Does this game please you? Have I won your praise? Do I deserve hearty thanks for my hunting skill? And Sir Gallant's like, yep. Best deer I've seen for many years, blah, 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 blah. 1384, then by the terms of our compact, it is yours. And Sir Gallant says, that's true. And I say the same to you, what I've honorably won inside this castle. With as much goodwill truly shall be yours. And he takes the other's strong neck in his arms, then he grabs him beside the head and kisses him. Take care of my winnings. I obtain nothing else. I bestow it on you freely. And he says, well, that's good. But where'd you get that kiss from? He goes, ah, that wasn't part of the deal. I, as far as I know, you went down to Piggly Wiggly and bought this venison, you know. That was not in our agreement. Ask nothing else. So, the knight says, double or nothing. Let's do it again. So the next morning, the lord of the castle and his men, 40 of them together, go off hunting. And remember what we had up here yesterday? So day one, deer. Day two, boar. Boar. Day three, we're going to see fox. So kiss, kiss, kiss. These are what Sir Gowan gives in return. What does Sir Gowan actually receive each of those days? Kiss, kiss, sash, belt, garter, however you want to call this thing. Okay? So, they go to kill the boar. You know, what's the difference between killing a deer and killing a boar? Boars so are they, allowed, uh, they have like thicker that. hides. Okay, they, they have thicker they, hides. They charge you and they can kill you. They charge you. They're bigger than deer. Medieval boar. In fact, there have been some found in the last four or five years in the United States, in Georgia, Texas, and Alabama. They also eat basically anything. Okay. Well, no, you you get a you get a uh, a boar spear, which is basically a big spear with two prongs on one end, so that the boar can't. Well, boars can. I'm five ten. Boars can be six feet tall at the shoulder. Wait, what? Yeah. They're shoulder. Big animals. 15-year-old kid killed one in, in Georgia a couple of years ago. Okay. So at the shoulder, that means they've got neck and head, so raise the head. So with head, they can stand seven feet tall. That's this. Okay? And tusks. Boars can disembowel people, <laughs> horses, etc. That's why you take 40 men. Okay? And a lot of dogs. Okay, Deer? The, the, the reason I use Bambi, because you know, what's Bambi going to hurt? Okay, Now, maybe after Bambi has been around for a little while and develops a big old rack, that can hurt, but the implication is it doesn't have it. So, while they're out there in this wild chase, meanwhile, back at the castle, Sir Gallon is asleep, and we're told 1470. Uh, 1471, nor did the lady fail to wish her guest good today. Early she was there, his mood to mollify. Why does his mood need mollifying? One day's down, two days to go, you know. So she comes in. She peeps in at the night. Sir Gowan welcomes her politely once. Notice he doesn't pretend to be asleep this time. It's almost like he's waiting for her. She returns his greeting with eager speech, sits gently down by his side, laughs, 
And she goes, I mean, if you were Sir Gallon, you, a man so strongly inclined to good cannot grasp the rules of polite behavior. And if someone instructs him, lets them drop out of mind. In other words, you forgot the lesson I taught you. No, what have I done? It's not, we've not even been together five seconds. How could I have done something wrong? He says, what lesson? I told you about kissing. How does she, how is she coming across? Forceful. Pushy. Kind of forceful, pushy. To act quickly wherever a glance of favor is seen. The implication is she has given him that glance of favor. Okay. That befits every knight who practices courtesy. He goes, enough of such talk. In other words, we'll quit talking. Come on. <laughs> Plant one on me. Let's get, let's get it going. For I dare not do that. That is, I can't do that. What? Lest I were refused. You come in, you sit down on my bed, and you want me to reach up and kiss you? No. What if you were like, no? I mean, the Me Too movement would fall on him like a ton of bricks. If repulsed, I should be at fault for having presumed. And she says, ma foi. Ma foi, my faith. What? You could not be refused. Now, she might mean, honey, there ain't a woman in the world who would say no to you. I mean, that is one very clear meaning. But she doesn't stop there. You are strong enough to force your will if you wish. If any woman were so ill-mannered as to reject you. Notice, any woman who rejected you and you forced yourself on her, it would be what? Easy. Yeah. What's the ill-mannered part mean? Her fault. If any woman said no to you, to you, well, you should just take it. Probably not Marie de France writing this. Well, take that back. She's long dead. Probably not a woman writing this. Whoever's writing this is trying to write it, you know, from her perspective. If any woman were so ill-mannered as to reject you. And Sir Gallon says, yeah, you're right, you know. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I could take whatever I want. But in my country, force is considered ignoble. That is, it's not a noble act. It is wrong to rape a woman. It's almost like the poet, just I want to make that clear for 500 years in the future, <laughs> not advocate. But that's pretty important because it leads us right up to the next thing we're going to read, Chaucer and the Wife of Bath's Tale, which involves a, an Arthurian knight who goes riding in the forest one day and meets a beautiful young maid and rapes her. And then he has to answer Guinevere, okay, which we'll talk about. So what you say is quite true, but in my country, force is considered ignoble. What else is he saying by that? Man, you guys are pigs here. You've got horrible manners, if that's okay, for a man to take what he wants. Notice that in my country. You know, we're civilized people. But in my country, force is considered ignoble, and so is each gift that is not freely given. I am at your disposal to kiss when it pleases you. He is saying, I'm here to please you, therefore take your pleasure. But he's not going to take his pleasure. It will be given. How? She has to initiate everything. You may take one when you like, and stop it seems good in a while. In a while, it's not just going to be a little short kiss. It's not just a peck on the cheek. She bends down over him and gives him a kiss. And for long, they then discuss love's misery and bliss. Why misery? 
before bliss. For in the 1940s, a guy named Denis de Rougemont, Denis de Rougemont, wrote a book called Love in the Western World. And in it, he argues that the Liebestod, L-I-E-B-E-S-T-O-D, or love death, is the model for all real love poetry slash writing in the Western world. Love death, the passionate love that leads to death. Give me some examples. All of you know these. Romeo you know at least one, Romeo and Juliet. Okay. If you've read any other Shakespeare, Antony and Cleopatra. Mm -hmm. Dido and Aeneas from classical myth. Othello. Tristan and Isolde. Othello. Othello and Desdemona. Lancelot and Guinevere. So Othello and Desdemona, it's because of Othello's jealousy. We're not going to talk about that. Lancelot and Guinevere. Okay. They're all what? All, by the way, also. Adulterous in one sense or another. Because one form of adultery within the Christian tradition is premarital sex. Romeo and Juliet. If they actually had premarital sex, it's not clear. Okay. But those all involve passionate love resulting in death. Okay. So, for long they then discuss love's misery and bliss. You got this great scene in Dante's Inferno, where Dante's going on down, and I think he's in the what, fourth circle, third or fourth circle, which is those who die as a result of passion. And he meets these two characters, real, real people, named Paolo and Francesca. Okay? Who were, I want to say they're a brother and sister in law, but I don't think that's true. Anyway, Francesca is married, and she and Paolo start up a love affair, and her husband finds them in flagrante, as the Italians put it, and he runs them through with a sword in the end, and they go to hell. Okay? And so for all eternity, they are constantly in this whirlwind of passion where they can never really quite catch up and touch each other. Well, this author probably would have known that book because Dante was pretty well known by the mid-14th century. Okay. Chaucer, definitely. Chaucer's really, really influenced by Dante. Uh, was that like, you know, like on like a newspaper or something like that? Like that's incense or like they were, you said they were real, right? Yeah, they're real people. I mean, they're look at get a copy of Dante's Inferno, get to that section, you know, last names are given, dates. I'm, something in my mind is telling me Paolo was her brother-in-law. And so, you know, brother, her husband comes in, finds his brother sleeping with his wife, and, you know, kills them both. So that could be the love's misery and bliss that they are um, talking about. Also, in the Middle Ages, because this is what is told us about Paolo and Francesca, usually when you get a man and a woman who are sitting there and they're reading and talking to each other about this kind of literature, romantic literature, Things happen. Things they don't plan on happening. <clears throat> Paolo, uh, Francesca says, yeah, yeah, we were just sitting there reading, and then, you know, we started kind of glancing over at each other, and before you know it, they're ripping each other's clothes off. So, Sir Gowan says, I would learn from you, uh, she says to him, I would learn from you if the question was not irksome, uh, what the reason was that someone... As young and valiant as yourself, so courteous, chivalrous, blah, 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 blah. True practice of knighthood, knighthoods of love, knighthoods very lore. 
For you to speak of the endeavors of true knights, the written heading of texts of their deeds is that. Okay? How knights have ventured their lives for true love. This is the courtly love tradition. Okay? Suffered for their love longings dismal times, later taken revenge on their misery through valor, bringing joy to their ladies, blah, blah, blah. So, I would learn from you, she says, this is what you knights do. <laughs> and what would she learn from him? Go down to 15, 22. Where I am, and I have sat by your side, two separate occasions, and yet I've not heard a solitary word from you about love. Why don't you talk to me about love? She's kind of saying, like, why don't you recite a love poem for me? And you, who make such courteous and elegant vows, like what? I'm here as your servant. I will serve you. I will do what you want. You should be eager to instruct a youthful creature and teach her some elements of skill in true love. She's saying, oh, shucks, Mr. Sir Gowan. I don't know nothing about no leaven. Teach me. Show me. Or are you ignorant to enjoy such great fame? Or, okay, no, notice what that means. Are you ignorant of love who enjoy such great fame? Is it all hype? Is it all a lie? Or maybe you think I'm too silly to take in courtly chat. Silly there means foolish. Maybe you think I'm too stupid to enjoy or understand this kind of conversation. Both of which break courtly love because you have to reject her when she does not feel protected. Right. For shame, I come here alone. To learn what? Your special play. That's not sword fighting. Well, <laughs> Freud would say it might be, you know, sword fighting of a sort. Show me your expertise while my husband is away. And he's like, may God reward you. It makes me really happy, pleases me, that one as noble as yourself should make your way here. He kind of turns the shucks like, oh shucks, honey. That you'd make your way all the way up here for little old me. Kind of like the beginning of the poem where he says, I know I'm the least of the knights of the round table. I'm the dumbest of the knights of the round table. And trouble yourself with a nobody, 1338, trif trifling with your knight with any kind of favor. It gives me delight. But, but no. To take the task on myself of explaining true love, and treat the matter of romance and chivalric tales to you, whom I know well, have more experience in that subject by half than a hundred such men as myself ever can, however long I may live, would be absolute folly, noble lady, on my word. What has he just told her and implied about her? Girl, I know you will. <laughs> How? I mean, you're entirely right, Sydney. Mm -hmm. How much does he know she knows? By half as much more than 100 knights. You know more about love than 150 knights do, honey. In other words, she's been around the block. Maybe like 150 times. <laughs> you know, knocking on each door, you know. Okay? I, I can't tell you, me, teach you about love. Yeah, right. Now, you would think she could be very upset by that. But she might be going, oh, you're flattering me, aren't you? I will carry out your desires with all my power. As I am in all duty bound and always will be the servant of your wish. And may God preserve me. Why the may God preserve me? Please do not take this any further than that. Yeah, because if she wants me to, God, I got to do it. <laughs> I, don't want I think he does. I think part of him wants to, but the other part, you know, the 
the little bugs bunny de demon on this side wants to, and the angel on this side is like, don't do it, buddy. <laughs> you also have that promise to give that guy everything you gain today. Yeah, that would be interesting, wouldn't it? Thus that lady made trial of him, tempting him many times. To what? To have led him into mischief, whatever her purpose. Well, if she's tempting him and she's making trial of him, isn't the purpose clear? No. Because whatever her purpose implies, that the tempting and the trial aren't serious. They're not honest. That is, she doesn't really want to sleep with him. She just wants to see if he will. Okay? I know, we're splitting hairs here. I mean, this is legalistic language. This is Bill Clinton's, you know, well, it depends on the definition of is, is. <laughs> and so what do they do? We're told... 1551, he defended himself so skillfully that no fault appeared, nor evil on either side. Neither of them, quote unquote, sins in this interchange. Nor anything did they feel but delight. This is not just what? What did the Green Knight offer when he arrived at Camelot? A game. It's like a game. They laugh and banter long. Then she kissed her guest charmingly and leaves. He gets up. Afterwards, dinner is cooked. The knight kills the boar. Bring it back at night. And top of 268, he presents it to Sir Gowan and says, It's all yours. I know I got a point for tomorrow. All yours. Sir Gowan says, Yep. And I'll give you what I gained. Grabs him by the neck and plants another one on him. And the knight's like, You know, I think you're getting a better deal out of this. Now we are quit, Sir Gowan says, at the end of the day of all the agreements we have made since I came here and do for him. Okay? Notice, you'll be a rich man if we keep doing this. Because what's Sir Gallon been giving away? Kisses, they don't cost him much. But now he's got a full, you know, freezer full of deer. Now a full freezer full of boar, so to speak. So, that evening, page 269, Sir Gallon says, you know, I got to leave tomorrow. Got to go find it. He goes, no, 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 hold on, I told you, you know, it's close. 1673, as I am an honest man, I give you my word, you shall reach the Green Chapel to settle your affairs on New Year's Day, well before nine. Therefore, lie in your bed tomorrow, it's December 31st, or tomorrow will be December 31st, lie in your bed, enjoy your ease, I'll hunt in the woods, we'll keep the compact, exchange winnings with you when I return here, for I have... Tested you twice. Okay, notice. He's just told Sir Gallon, this is a test. And find you trustworthy. Best throw, third time. Best throw means what? Third time's a charm. And all or nothing. That is, you fail on the third time, what does that do for the first two? <laughs> Cancels them out. Okay. So, Shagown goes to sleep, uh, goes to sleep, rests. In the morning, the Lord gets up, goes to mass, goes off to hunt. This time, he hunts for what? A fox. Which is more dangerous, deer, boar, or fox? Boar, boar, hands down. Boar, even deer, because a deer can kick you to death. What's a fox gonna do? Nibble on your ankle? Because they're they're not that big. Okay? I mean, you've got to be in pretty bad shape for a fox to be able to harm you. You kick the little buzzard, you know. However. But what are foxes known for? Fast. Louder? Fast. Fast. They're clever. Boars? 
lumbering morons. Deer, innocent. I mean, you drive down the road, the deer runs in the middle of the highway and does what? <laughs> Smack, you know? It's like the mammal version of a turkey. I mean, dumber than dumb. Okay? The fox isn't. We talk about people or something being sneaky as a fox. Okay? So, they go hunt fox. Meanwhile, back at the castle, there's Sir Gowan. 1732. Behind splendid bed curtains on the cold morn. But out of love, the lady did not let herself sleep, nor the purpose to weaken that was fixed in her heart. She rose from her bed quickly, hastened there in a charming mantle, reaching to the ground. Richly lined with well-trimmed furs, no modest coif on her head, but skillfully cut gems, arranged about her hair front in clusters of twenty. Her lovely face... Notice, have we been given detailed descriptions of the lady on the previous two mornings? No. Now, how does she appear? Dressed to kill. In other words, she's pulling out all the stops on this one. Her breast was exposed, and that might mean literally. Now, it might literally mean that, but it probably just means low cut. And her shoulders bare, she enters the chamber and shuts the door after her, throws open a window, calls to the night, and says, get up. Morning's so clear. But he's been sound asleep, but troubled in his sleep. Why? He's going to die today. Yeah. Well, not today. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. This is the 31st. It's the next day. He thinks about his fate with the man at the Green Chapel. But he wakes up. He gets up. She comes in, pulled behind the bed curtains, and we're told. 1757. The gracious lady approached him laughing sweetly, bent over his handsome face, and daintily kissed him. He welcomes her politely with charming demeanor, seeing her so radiant and attractively dressed. Now, I can't help but think, because I'm a dirty old man, but if she's wearing a low-cut gown and she bends over to kiss him, she's giving him a show. He welcomes her politely. 1761. Every part of her so perfect and in color so fine. Hot, passionate feeling welled up in his heart. Yeah, probably other parts of his body, too. Smiling gently and courteously, they make playful speech so that all that passed between them was happiness, joy, and delight. Notice, no tinge of negativity there. Nothing bad, nothing wrong, nothing sinful. Gracious words they spoke, and pleasure reached its height. Great peril threatened. What should Mary not mind her night? He stands on a knife's edge if Mary doesn't remember him. Meaning, if Mary doesn't go, oh Lord, save Sir Gallon, you know, because he's about to fall big time. Why? 1770. For that noble lady so constantly pressed, pushed him so close to the verge that either he must take her love there and then, yeah, that does mean have sex with her, or churlishly reject it. That is, like a churl. Who were the churls? Peasants. Lowest class in society. Well, he's a knight. He's way up here. That would be violating courtly love. That would be violating chivalry. Violating the knightly code. He felt concerned for good manners. Lest he behave like a boor. And still more lest he shame himself by an act of sin. Notice. Good manners and virtuous living, they're pretty much the same. To not show good manners is to be sinful and treacherously betray the lord of the castle. So, he's got to be careful with how he responds to her. Because it would be a violation of good manners, it would be sinful. 
And he thinks, God forbid, that shall not come about. What? That he will treacherously betray the Lord of the castle. So with affectionate laughter, he put to one side all the loving inducements that fell from her mouth. And she said, you deserve rebuke if you feel no love for the person you are lying beside. More than anyone on earth wounded in her heart, unless you have a mistress. She gives him an out, right? She says, you should be rebuked because you've not done anything. And here I am, ready, willing, and able. Oh, I get it. You got a girlfriend, don't you? You have a mistress. Someone you prefer? How is this different than Guinevere to Lonval? Guinevere's like, here I am. You can have me. He's like, you, I've got somebody. And does she go, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Yeah, you're monogamous, I get it. No, she gets all, you know, bent out of shape. She's at least saying, it's okay. If, if you've got somebody else that you love, I, I understand. And you've plied a troth with that lady. I mean, that's even better. So strongly tied that you wish not to break it. And what does he do? By St. John in truth, I have no one, nor seek one for this while. Nope. So what did she give him that could have allowed him to not churlishly reject her, to not sin or anything? She kind of created a door and threw it wide open. And all he had to do was say, yeah, that's true. I have a lover. But it's a lie. that would be a lie. And he is the pentangle on the outside of the shield, which says, what? I don't lie. I don't do anything wrong. I'm perfect. Right? I mean, that's what that sign symbolizes. He's perfect in everything. And she goes, oh, man, that's, that's the worst you could have done. You don't love anyone, and you're not looking for anyone, and I, I don't do anything to you. She goes, no, that's okay, though. I've answered indeed and painfully. Kiss me now lovingly, and I'll leave. Go die. I must spend my, I'm, you think I'm kidding, my life grieving as a woman deeply in love. Her husband's going to be back later that day. So what's she saying? Yeah, but why have hamburger when you can have filet mignon? <laughs> I mean, that's what she's saying. You give me something as a present, something I can remember you by. And he's like, I, I wish I had something. The dearest thing in the world I possess for you, for you have truly deserved wonderfully often more recompense. He says, but I don't. To give you as a love token something worth little would do you no honor. In other words, if I were going to give you something as a love token, what would what would he have to give her? <laughs> the world. I'd have to give you something of such expense, but I don't have anything like that. Okay? He said, I, I want to give you a glove, you know. She says, no. No, though I get no gift from you, you shall have one from me. And she holds out a ring, we're told. Finely worked gold, sparkling jewel. Take it. He goes, I love this. Yeah, it is symbolic, by the way, that she gives him a ring. Okay? Something that something else can be put through. I want no gifts, I swear. I, why? Because I have nothing to offer you kind of following the gift-giving exchange rule, which is, I give you a gift, you give me a gift. Okay? That's the gift-giving exchange rule. She keeps pressing him. He's, no, no, no. She goes, oh, okay, so if you reject my ring because you think it too precious, wish not to be so deeply indebted, okay, then let me give you my girdle. Notice where the girdle is, around her waist. And he goes, well, I, don't, I don't want that. She goes, I, I get it. You don't want it because you don't think it's worth anything. You think it's just a trifle because it's worth too little, 1847. Yeah, and it appears that way. It is a trifle, worth even less. But 
if you knew what power was woven into this thing, anybody who wears this, what? Will not die. You've got the Allstate girdle. You're in good hands with this girdle because you can't die. What should he immediately start to think about? You know, I met this guy once who couldn't die. <laughs> and he suffered her pleading and allowed her to speak. She pressed the belt on him, offering it at once, and he consented. And gave way with good grace. And she said, but don't tell anybody. And he goes, no, 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 don't worry, not going to tell anybody. She kisses him and leaves. And what does he do? He gets up, dresses himself finely, hides the girdle, and goes to the chapel. Why? He approaches a priest privately, 1877, asks him to hear his confession, and instruct him more clearly how his soul can be saved when he leaves this world. In other words, he asks the priest to instruct him, what do I need to do during this life to make it so that when I die, I don't go to the hot place. <laughs> I go to heaven. And he confesses himself honestly, admits his sins, both great and small, begs forgiveness. The priest gives him absolution. The priest absolves him completely, made him as clean as if the judgment were appointed for the next day, which, you know, metaphorically, it is, <laughs> because he thinks he's going to die. Okay, here's a question for you. At this point, does Sir Gallant plan on fulfilling his bargain with the knight, the lord of the castle? The bargain is what? I'll get you what I kill in the field. You give me what you get here. Because if he is planning on reneging on that deal, if he's not planning on keeping to his part of it, then he's planning on what? Sinning. Violating his oath. And if he's planning on sinning, though he hasn't yet, is that a sin? Because if he's gone to the priest and confessed and been absolved, then all is good and fine. He shouldn't be able to die, go straight to heaven. But if he's gone to the priest and he's confessed and he's still planning on doing something and he hasn't admitted that to the priest and gotten absolution for it and then doesn't do it, then he's in trouble. So, he stays there the rest of the day. The knight comes back. The knight gives him the fox. And Sir Gown gives him three kisses. Next morning, Sir Gallon wakes up, and he goes off to find the Green Knight. I'm going to skip a bunch. His horse is made ready, and what does the Lord of the Castle give him to help him find his way? Or command to help him find his way? He doesn't give him to him like a slave. The porter. The porter is going to lead him on his way to the Green Chapel. So, page 279, line 2091. Bottom of the right-hand column. The porter says, I've guided you here, sir, on this day. Now you're not far from that notorious place. And I'll tell you truly, because I know who you are. And I love you dearly. Follow my advice. What's his advice? Do not go there. Don't go. Okay. There lives a man in that wilderness, the worst in the world, 2098, for he is powerful and grim and loves dealing blows, bigger than any other man on earth. Body is mightier than the four strongest men in Arthur's household. Hector or any other. Okay. He brings it about. So anybody who goes by the Green Chapel, What? who is not battered to death by force of his hand. That is, if you're just wandering through the woods and you accidentally get there, you're a dead man. Okay? 
He is a pitiless man, 2106, who never shows mercy, whether peasant or churchman passes his chapel, monk or mass priest or any. Okay. So he says, leave him and do what? Go home by some other road. Take a detour. Okay. And I'll go back to the castle and I'll tell him, yeah, I sent him on his way, showed him where the chapel was. I won't tell you where he is. Your secret's safe with me. <laughs> Sir Gowan says, thanks. And I, I, I believe you would keep my secret. But if I avoid this place, took to my heels in fright in the way you propose, I will be a cowardly knight and could not be excused. No, no, I'll go to the chapel, whatever chance may happen, and discuss with that man whatever matter I please. And the porter essentially says what? Good luck. Line from Princess Bride. Have fun storming the castle. Why? Because you're a dead man. <laughs> you're a stupid dead man. Okay? So Gallon says, I will be a cowardly knight if I don't go. Okay, he is going, right? Well, what's he bringing with him? The gold of the life. Cowardly? He's, he's going to take up his, you know, his burden. He's going to get his lick. Is he cheating? I'm not saying he is. I'm asking. Is what he doing trying to cheat? Is he really laying it all in fate or in chance? Okay. So, Sir Gowan goes along, line 2156, said Gawain, by God himself, I shall not moan or cry. My life is in his hands, his will, I obey, and the little green sash. <laughs> so, how much does he really trust God's hands? Because it might be like God goes, oops, <laughs> and drops them. So he goes on. And he reaches the Green Chapel. Big old mound, 2178. He walks around it, has a hole at the end on either side, covered all over with grass, hollow inside, nothing but an old cave. And he says, is this it? Well, here probably at midnight, the devil his matin says. Notice what he's automatically assuming. He says, man, this, this looks like it could be. I mean, it's evil, overgrown with grass, you know. A man dressed in green, yeah, this, this is the right place for him to perform his devotions and devilish ways. Now my senses tell me the devil himself has forced this agreement on me to destroy me. Talk about jumping to conclusions. Why? Because he's thinking that he's about to die, maybe. Okay? And he hears... As a giant whetstone is being turned, and the green knight is sharpening his axe. I mean, this guy knows all about presentation and you know how to enter a scene. Twenty-two, oh three. It whirred and sang like water at a mill. It rasped. It rang terrible to hear. And Sir Gallant thinks this is like a welcoming ceremony. Okay. So he calls out, who's master of this place? And somebody on the hillside says, wait. You'll have all that I promised you once. In other words, just hold on. Hold your horses. I'm not ready yet. So the green knight walks down. He sets the handle to the ground, walks beside it. Comes to the stream, refuses to wait. He hops over on his axe, almost like pole vaulter. Okay? And Sir Gowan sees him. And the knight says, Good sir, a man may trust your vow. And the green man, Gowan, may God protect you. Now, is that something that a follower of Satan would say? No. Not necessarily. You are welcome, sir, to my place. You've timed your journey. You know the agreement. I get to repay you back. Nobody here separate us. Sir Gallon. 
By God who gave me a soul, I shall bear you no grudge at all, whatever hurt comes about. Limit yourself to one blow, and I will stand still and not resist whatever it pleases you to do at all. And so what does he do? He bends forward, pulls his hair up, because, you know, he doesn't want his beautiful locks to get cut. And seeming unafraid, and the green knight comes up, when with all the strength in his body, he heaves it in the air, and he swings it as if to mangle him, and what does Sir Gallant do? He does this. Hunches his shoulder, so what? There's no neck to hit. He flinches. You're not Gallant, who is reputed so good, who never quailed from an army on Valley or Hill, and now flinches for fear. Because fear is what? Is fear the thing that one actually fears? No. Fear is the expectation. But you don't know that the thing that you actually fear is going to come about. What are you afraid of? Well, what is Sir Gowan afraid of? He thinks he has what coming? So he goes like, I'm sorry, I flinched once, I won't do it again. So he takes position, and this time the knight swings and doesn't hit him. He's like, I had to make sure you weren't going to flinch again. Okay. By this time, Sir Gowan's, you know, he's fit to be tied. He's really, really angry. Okay. So, 2300, strike away, you fierce man. You waste time and threats. So and the knight's like, okay, come on. What does he do? He brings it down straight, 2309, with the cutting edge of the blade over Sir Gallant's bare neck. Although he struck fiercely, he hurt him no more than to slash the back of his neck, laying open the skin. It doesn't mean he cuts to the bone. It's a nick across the back of his neck. Enough for blood. That's it. It's enough to draw blood. So that bright blood shot over his shoulders to the ground. And when the knight saw his blood, that is, Sir Gowen, saw his blood, what does he do? Leaps forward with both feet more than a spear's length. The spear is six to eight feet long. So he broad jumps. Six to eight feet. Why? He's getting away from the knight, the green knight. He's like, that's it. You had your shot. No more. Okay. And the knight's just standing there resting on his axe. Now, this axe, I think it was this axe we were told, that this axe had a blade that was four feet. The blade looked something like this. Sorry, it should be like that. Four feet from here to here. That's a big stinking axe, okay? That thing weighs 50 pounds, 75 pounds, something like that. It's pretty heavy, okay? And what does the knight say? 2338. Don't act so wrathfully in this place. I haven't miscourteously mistreated you here. Or acted contrary to the covenant sworn at the king's court. I promised you a blow and you have it. Take yourself well paid. I free you from the rest of all other obligations. What other obligations? So Gallant should be thrown, what? What? A, I have no other obligations to you. Had I been more dexterous, maybe I could have dealt you a more spiteful blow to have roused your anger, for I threatened you playfully with a pretense. Avoided giving you a gash, doing so rightly because of the agreement we made on the first night. And the alarm bell should start going off in Sir Gallant's mind. What agree? What night? When you faithfully and truly kept your pledged word. That is, you gave me a kiss. Gave me all your winnings. The other faint. The second swing. I gave you for the second day. When you kissed my lovely wife and gave me those kisses. <laughs> for both occasions, I aimed at you two mere mock blows without harm. Why? Because kissing didn't violate any oaths. In fact, you fulfilled your oath on each day. Ah, but the 
third throw, third throw, what? It's my belt you're wearing there. 2356, you failed me the third time and took that blow therefore. For it's my belt you are wearing, that same woven girdle. My own wife gave it to me. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know all about your kisses. I know all about your courteous manners. My wife's wooing of you. I arranged it myself. I put her up to it. This is why the poet said that she did what? Tested, tried, though faultless in purpose. Okay? It's all what? It's part of a game. What's the game related to? The game back at Sir King Arthur's court. Okay? One of the most perfect men, to me, you truly seem one of the most perfect men who ever walked on the earth. His pearls are more valuable than the white peas. Why, why does he think that? Remember what she says to Sir Gallant? No woman could turn you down. I think the knight is saying that about his wife. Any other man, pff, he'd be down for the count. No. Here you fell a little and lacked fidelity. What is the pentangle the symbol of? Fidelity. It's faithful in what? Five fives. Okay. So if he lacked a little fidelity, what happened to his fidelity? Can you be a little bit pregnant? No. Can you be a little bit dead? No. Nope. You either are or you aren't. Oh, he's not dead. He's just mostly dead. He's... I'm feeling better. How false is he? <laughs> Five senses, five fingers, five wounds of Christ. How much faith does he place in those? The five joys of Mary. And so mortified and crushed that he inwardly squirmed, all the body, all the blood in his body burned in his face. Chagallan does what? He throws the belt. A curse upon cowardice and covetousness. Cowardice. That's, you know, fatal flaw for a knight. Covetousness, that goes against one of the Ten Commandments. You breed, cowardice and covetousness breed boorishness and vice that ruin virtue. And he takes the belt and throws it. There it is, take it. The fear of your blow taught me cowardice. Really? Did it really teach him cowardice? Or did it reveal? Was the cowardice already there and it just needed, you know, something to kind of shine a light on it? To give way to covetousness be false to my nature. What's he saying about his nature? It's been breached. Okay, but he says the cowardice and the covetousness made him false to his nature. Is he saying that he's naturally good will? Yes. What's the problem with that statement? Nobody's naturally good, right? <laughs> yeah. Rich young ruler, I taught good man is hard to find in my intro lit students the other day. Rich young ruler comes to Jesus and says, Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, Why do you call me good? There's none good but God. But I'll answer your question anyways. And I think I think what Jesus is doing there is going, Good job. You recognized me. I am God. I am the only one you can call good. And so what does he tell him? Follow the laws. Well, which ones? You know, because he's like a student. I want to know what's the bare minimum I need to do to pass. You know? <laughs> well, which ones? And Jesus gives him a list. He goes, yeah, I've done all this from my youth up. Okay, cool. Here's your problem. Go and sell all that you have. Give it to the poor. Come and follow me. So sell everything you have, all the proceeds. Give to the poor. Come follow me. 
and walks away. Why? Because he was rich. Okay? Actually, no, it's because he broke the law of piety. No. Did he really? Did no, he, no. Yeah. Go back and read the Gospels. Yeah. It's because he was a rich man. No, it wasn't because he was a rich man. It was because he broke the law of piety. No. Connor, you're wrong. <laughs> Serious. Read the Gospels. Each of the three Gospel accounts says, Christ says, because he was a rich man. Okay? So, what's being said? Sir Gowan is implying here that he believes what about himself that we heard earlier? That he is naturally good. That he is perfect. Okay? That's the whole thing about the symbolism of the pentangle. If you are perfect in your five senses, these kinds of senses, seeing, hearing, tasting, smelling, touching, if you are perfect in your fingers, if you're perfect in your faith, that means what? You never doubt. Never. Well, who does that describe? Pretty much only one person, the one nailed to the cross, you know, in traditional Western Christianity. So, he says, these things taught me to be false to my nature. The generosity and fidelity expected of knights. Now, the generosity and fidelity might be explaining what, what he means by nature. And Pentecost oath, what are knights supposed to do? They're supposed to go out and help people, etc. Instead, what did he do? He took that little sash and kept it for himself. Now I am false and unworthy, and have always dreaded treachery and deceit. And he launches into, um, hold on, before he, the, before he launches, the knight says, chill out, man. You're going overboard here. And he offers him the belt, keep it, and he says, let's go back to the castle. Let me reacquaint you with my wife. You know, who was your cunning foe, 2405 and 06. And Sir Gowan's like, no, no, I've stayed long enough. Good fortune, you know, attend you. i got to go back home. Okay, commend me to your wife. And then what does he launch into? Same kind of thing we're, gonna, we're going to hear the wife of Bath talk about. This big, long, it's typically called an anti-feminist tract. Because who does he blame for all the problems in the world? Women. If it weren't for Eve, Adam would still be in paradise. Yeah, but where would the rest of us be? <laughs> Not. Okay? And he talks about women. He talks about Eve. He talks about Delilah. He talks about Bathsheba. Okay, even Delilah. Eve does tempt Adam according to that story. Honey, come look what I tried. It's really good. Delilah tempts Samson. David and Bathsheba. Mm -mm. doesn't work at all. Because what's happening in that story? David's minding his own business one day. He looks out the window. Not a window, per se, but an opening in the wall. And he sees some chick on a rooftop a couple doors down sunning herself. And he's like, whoa, bring her here. They bring her here. He sleeps with her. She gets pregnant. He knows who her husband is and has what done to her husband, Uriah the Hittite. He tries a couple things before he essentially has him killed first because there's a war going on. He says, Uriah, you know, come back from the war. Why don't you stay in town for a while, you know, spend some time with Uriah. But Uriah, being the good soldier he is, says, I can't have fun while my men are out there fighting. And so he doesn't sleep with his wife. David's like, damn. She's pregnant. i got to get this fixed somehow. And so he sends Uriah to the hottest part of the war. Why? So that he'll be killed. And once he's killed, then David can marry Bathsheba. Okay? It's not Bathsheba. She has no say in that matter. Okay? So, big, long, anti-feminist trap. So Sir Gallon goes back home. By the way, it's after that that the knight tells us who turned him green and for what purpose? 
to try and you know, frighten Guinevere into like having a heart attack. Yeah, to scare Guinevere to death. Who did it? Morgan Le Fay. Who the knight tells Sir Gallen is what relation to him? Uh, Your aunt. Why? Because Morgan Le Fay is Arthur's half sister. You know, sister. She's got a sister, you know. So Mordred, who is Arthur's half son, he's Arthur's whole son, but it's the son he conceives with his half sister. So don't do incest because it's going to end up killing you, is kind of the story there. So he goes back home. He tells everybody what happens. Page 290. He holds up the girdle. It says, see, this belt caused the scar that I bear on my neck. This is the injury and damage that I have suffered. For the cowardice and covetousness that sees me there. This is the token of the dishonesty I was caught committing. Now I will wear this as long as I live. For a man may hide his misdeed, but never erase it. For where once it takes root, the stain can never be lifted. And this is probably the medieval Christian poet getting in some pretty deep theology. Why? Because according to medieval Christianity, no matter what you do, you can never erase the stain of sin. Only somebody else can do that. In other words, this is Sir Gowan kind of recollecting and thinking back about all his earlier press releases, all the good news, all the reputation, and he's kind of going... Yeah, not so much. I'm really not as good as I thought I was. And the king consoles the knight. And I think that could be because Arthur's been going like, really? You finally realize that? Damn, maybe you are the stupidest one in all of Camelot. <coughs> Might be. I'm not saying that is the case. So what do they do? They all start wearing the girdle or garter, as it becomes called, as what sign? Is it a sign of human frailty? Is it kind of like a walking around and going, don't? An indication, a physical emblem. We're all fallen. Okay? So in the time of Archer, 2522, Arthur, this adventure happened, and the Chronicles of Britain bear witness to it, after the brave hero Brutus, blah, 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 okay? And we get the motto at the very end. Oniswaki mal y pense. And you've got a gloss, old French, evil be to him who evil thinks. Okay? What does that mean, though? If you think evil, of something, it is what? It is evil for you. St. Paul, for example, talks about it in the New Testament in some of his letters, talks about fasting. and says, you know, if you approach a certain, a certain food and you think it's bad for you, guess what? It is bad for you. If you don't think that, it's not. So somebody who thinks meat, I shouldn't eat meat, it's not good for me, it's not good for that person to eat meat. But don't judge somebody who doesn't eat meat because you do eat meat because it's not bad for you if you don't think it's bad. Milton puts in the mouth of Satan in Paradise Lost. Um, the mind can make a heaven of hell a hell of heaven. It all depends on what? Your perspective. Okay? That phrase, by the way, the only saw qui mal y pense, is the motto of the Order of the Garter, which was founded in the mid-14th century. About the same time as the poem is written. Okay? And it's thought that whoever the poet is, the poet knows about the motto. It's been created maybe in the last 20 years, and the poet comes up with this big idea for a foundation poem for the founding of the Order of the Garter. People are still inducted into the Order of the Garter today. Queen does it every year. 
where she offers her honor, what are called the honors. Okay. Uh, any questions? Okay, we'll stop there with Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. I don't think there's anything else I need to do. Chaucer, we're going to get a little bit behind again because I can't do general prologue in two days, or excuse me, in a single day. Yeah, I might be able to. But read the general prologue for Tuesday. Um, if we have a quiz, it'll just be over all of Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, you know, and you know, this kind of stuff. And then we have, the only other two things we have for Middle English before we have an exam is the general prologue and the life of Bath's Tales. Okay?